This place has no time zone, no landmass, and the sun rises and sets here just once a year. For over 400 years, since the era of King Henry VIII, thousands of explorers from all over the world were trying to reach this elusive spot, the North Pole. Some were hoping to find a northwest or northeast passage to China and the Indies, and others just wanted to see what it was like. In 1773, the British Royal Navy organized the first scientific expedition to the North Pole. Constantine Phipps volunteered to lead the mission. It was difficult for the two ships to move through thick ice, and they had to be towed using smaller boats. At some point, Phipps was ready to leave the ships as they saw a completely frozen sea. But in the end, they broke free from the ice and escaped into the open sea to return home without reaching the goal. In 1882, American explorer James Booth Lockwood managed to get closer to the goal than anyone else. By that time, at least 750 people in 42 expeditions had lost their lives trying to make it to the pole. On the 7th of September, 1909, the New York Times came out with a sensational front page. Perry discovers the North Pole after eight trials in 23 years. Robert E. Perry, an American explorer, claimed to have reached the North Pole in April of the same year. But communication back then was slower than now, so the message had only reached New York by September. A week before the famous headline, the New York Herald had published its own front-page sensation. The North Pole is discovered by Dr. Frederick A. Cook. Cook, another American explorer, had vanished into the Arctic for over a year and had everyone convinced he reached the pole in April 1908, a whole year before Perry. It was tricky to provide evidence any of them had actually reached the goal back then. Their goal was constantly moving on sea ice, unlike the South Pole on steady land, so they couldn't just leave a flag or some other proof there. A travel diary full of details of the journey, including daily distances, the position of the stars and the like, would probably do as evidence. But neither Cook nor Perry were able to provide any of this backup information. So each of them started a campaign to prove they were honest and trustworthy. Perry was mentioned as the North Pole discoverer until 1988. That's when the National Geographic Society revisited the evidence and found that his records really didn't prove his claim. Cook's claim was neither proven nor disproven. Australian-born British explorer Sir Hubert Wilkins went on his first expedition to the North Pole in 1913. That's when he got the idea to reach the goal by submarine. In 1931, he borrowed a special submarine named O-12 from the U.S. Navy. The future mission had two goals – to do scientific experiments while floating on ice and moving underwater, and to reach the North Pole by traveling beneath the ice. They planned to study the weather, take temperature measurements, and collect water samples from both the surface and the sea floor. The submarine Sir Hubert used was brought to a shipyard in New Jersey to be modified. They added the latest scientific equipment and changed the outside so the submarine could travel under the ice. On March 16th, the submarine left the shipyard to start its journey to the Brooklyn Navy Yard in New York. But even before leaving the Delaware River, they faced delays. A snowstorm forced them to stop at the Philadelphia Navy Yard, and they had to stop again to get more fuel. When the submarine was entering New York Harbor, a crew member who was just 27 years old fell overboard and drowned. The submarine was officially renamed Nautilus, and the grandson of Jules Verne, the author of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which inspired the new name, was there to see it. Before starting their journey, the crew tested the Nautilus in different spots off the New England coast. They faced criticism and were already two months behind schedule so they decided to head straight to England. During their trip across the Atlantic, they sailed into severe storms. On the 13th of June, the starboard engine broke down. Then, the port engine failed because it was overused. While crossing the Atlantic, Sir Hubert Wilkins kept radioing the submarine's position back to the United States. After both engines failed, they sent out an SOS. On June 15th, the USS Wyoming, a huge ship on a training cruise with naval students, reached the Nautilus. The Wyoming towed the broken submarine to Queenstown, Ireland, and then it was taken to Davenport, England for repairs. They had to wait for spare parts from the United States, which caused more delays. Once the Nautilus was fixed, 
they headed to Bergen, Norway to meet the submarine science officers and get more equipment. One of the most important additions in Bergen was a diving chamber, which allowed them to lower scientific tools into the water through a special hatch. On August 5th, the Nautilus finally left Bergen and headed north to find ice floes. They had lots of delays because of mechanical problems and storms. One storm even made the submarine tilt at crazy angles. Finally, on August 19th, they saw the first ice flow. For a few days, they followed the ice's edge, looking for a good spot to dive. Three days later, they tried to dive under the ice, but discovered that the submarine's diving rudders were missing. One diver went overboard to check and saw that someone must have broken off the rudders on purpose. This made Wilkins think that someone on the crew had sabotaged the submarine because they didn't trust the mission. Even without the rudders, Wilkins still wanted to do some of his scientific experiments. On the last day of August, they found a way to force the Nautilus under a three-foot thick ice floe. They had to fill the ballast tanks and adjust the trim. They managed to make more dives under this ice this way before the journey ended. After a few more days of trying to do research, Wilkins decided it was too dangerous to stay at sea. The Nautilus arrived at Svalbard, the Norwegian archipelago between mainland Norway and the North Pole, on September 8th, after going through the worst storm of the trip. They planned to go to a port in England, but another storm caused a lot of damage and made the engines fail, so they had to stop in Bergen again. After getting permission from the United States Shipping Board, the Nautilus was towed out of Bergen and sunk in a Norwegian fjord on November 13, 1931. In 1958, a U.S. submarine with the same name, Nautilus, became the first vessel that reached the North Pole by traveling under the ice. This Nautilus was much bigger than the submarines that came before it. It was 319 feet long and weighed 3,590 tons. For comparison, the other Nautilus was 175 feet long. Unlike other submarines, the new Nautilus could stay underwater for a longer time because of its special atomic engine didn't need air and only used a tiny amount of nuclear fuel. On July 23, 1958, it left Pearl Harbor, Hawaii on Operation Sunshine. There were 116 people on board, Commander Anderson, 111 officers and crew, and four civilian scientists. The Nautilus traveled north through the Bering Strait and only surfaced once at Point Barrow, Alaska. On August 1st, the submarine left the north coast of Alaska and dove under the Arctic ice cap. The submarine traveled at a depth of 500 feet, with the ice above it between 10 to 50 feet thick. At 11.15 p.m. on August 3rd, Commander Anderson told his crew, for the world, our country, and the Navy, the North Pole and the Nautilus went right under the North Pole without stopping. On August 5th, the submarine came up in the Greenland Sea, and then, two days later, it finished its historic trip in Iceland. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.